good morning uh, today we are going to do the fourth uh, free mixed paper discussion so we'll start with the sba first okay yeah, good morning right okay so we start with the sba right okay so what is the most common cause of central precocious puberty in girls yes what is the answer what is the most common cause of central precocious puberty in girls what is the answer right so what is precocious puberty yeah can anybody say what is precocious puberty so the precocious puberty is if somebody attain menarche before 8 years it's a precocious puberty right so that is called precocious puberty so the precocious puberty precocious puberty could be due to central or peripheral right so if it is a central precocious puberty actually puberty start what is happening as we know the the follicular development need to be started so follicular development is under control of hypothalamus pituitary ovary and axis right hypothalamus pituitary ovary and axis when the hypothalamus secrete a pulsatile secretion of gnrh stimulate the pituitary to produce fsh when the fsh release that fsh will stimulate the ovary so ovary and follicle will start to develop developing follicle will release the estrogen that estrogen is responsible for the secondary sexual characteristic development do you understand so this is how the puberty occurs so it is a complex procedure but uh, it it take long time even though this is the basic right so basically hypothalamus pituitary ovary axis need to be started so here pulsatile gnrh secretion start bit early do you understand so pulsatile secretion of gnrh starting bit early okay so in in uh, normal puberty it start after 8 years when it is start before 8 years that is central so your central line started so gnrh secreting more fsh secreting then pituitary so over stimulating then stimulated ovary will produce the estrogen secondary sexual characteristic will develop so it it is uh, it is it, this is called central precocious puberty so common cause for the central precocious puberty is idiopathy we don't know the reason it start bit early or maybe a tumor in in hypothalamus or pituitary right so or maybe uh, irritation right so which which advance in the hypothalamus pituitary ovary and axis this is called central one second one peripheral precocious puberty what is peripheral puberty actually this hypothalamus and pituitary is not secreting bit early that is normal that there is no changes in the central axis but from the periphery the estrogen is coming out this estrogen will stimulate the secondary sexual characteristic as well as endometrial proliferation and patient might have per vaginal bleeding this is called peripheral like so uh, exogenous estrogen if somebody take exogenous estrogen that exogenous estrogen actually the hypothalamus pituitary axis is normal but still that 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 particular girl is exposing to estrogen that estrogen will uh, like um, stimulate the uh, over uh, secondary sexual characteristic and endometrial thickening and the endometrium might shed off and it might cause bleeding do you understand that is called secondary sexual cause uh, secondary uh, peripheral precocious puberty or maybe uh, estrogen secreting tumors in adrenal gland maybe ovary so here what is happening so the estrogen is coming from the tumor so those are peripheral precocious puberty so whatever it is here the lady is at, at, attending menarche before the physiological age so here the question is what is the most common cause for the central precocious puberty so it's actually speaking it is a very very normal question 
So if you talk to your seniors last time, they have changed uh, the question uh, style. So this kind of uh, straightforward theory question, nowadays they are changing a bit. Now they are, they are, they are trying to uh, set the paper like MRCOG, right? So, so you might heard about the MRCOG, uh, member of Royal College of Obstetrician and Gynecology entrance exams, right? So MRCOG part two, um, SBA questions are like a half page question. So not, not like a short question. So each and every question is like a half page. So then you need to read a lot and you have to find the answer. So last time, uh, last MCQ um, uh, paper was like that. Most of the questions are very big question, not like the theory, this, this one theory. It is a big case scenario. So the problem is the time management. So when you, when you, when you, when you do that paper, you need to read all those questions. So when you, when you do that question, so you need to read, it's take time. And the most important, it's okay, even sometimes you might uh, good in reading, but the problem is when you read that much of paragraph, among that paragraph, you need to identify the key points. What are the important things you need to take from the question? Then you need to apply knowledge, rational thinking. Then now you get the answer. So in this um, free paper, actually I have put few questions like that with a very big, big paragraph. So then you need to read the question and find out the answer. So, because depending on the exam style, we need to change our question, question, question uh, type as well. Okay, right, great. So, uh, what is the most common cause for the 70 year old girl attendance, attends the gynecology clinic with her mother. She present with primary amenorrhea. 20 year old girl attend to the anti uh, gynecology clinic with her mother. Uh, she presented with primary amenorrhea. On examination, she is told with BMI of 19 kilograms per meter square. She, is, uh, she has normal breast development, but short blind ended vagina. There is no axillary or pubic hair. What is the most likely diagnosis? Hello? Are you all there? What is the most likely diagnosis? Yeah, right. Okay. Great. Your answers are correct. Here, uh, actually, the question is the primary amenorrhea, right? A 20-year-old girl presented with primary amenorrhea. First of all, you need to know what is primary amenorrhea. What is primary amenorrhea? What is primary amenorrhea? Primary amenorrhea is absence of pervaginal bleeding after so here we have two category of definition, right? One, patient with secondary sexual characteristic. Second one, patient without secondary sexual characteristic. Why it is? Because if, uh, if you take this um, puberty, it is a long time process, right? So menstrual bleeding is the last event, like your final exam. So you are, you are studying for five years, first year, second year, third year, fourth year, fifth year. So your final exam or maybe a ERPM is the last event. But to become doctor, your process has been started five years ago. Do you understand? Five years ago. Not, 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 not the ERPM. So without doing your MD degree, without doing your first year, second year, third year, can you do the ERPM? Obviously no. So this process has been started with early and it's ongoing. The last, the, uh, what, what do you call that? Your graduation ceremony is the menstrual bleeding. The last event, that is your recognition. Now, when the girl is having first menstrual bleeding, you are saying she, attain menarche. But before she have a first menstrual bleeding, she's having a lot of development. It has been started for a long time and it's going ongoing for a long time. So there, 
their internal organ development, their growth, secondary sexual characteristic development, breast development, right? uh, psychological changes. This process has been started a bit early and it's ongoing. And the last event is the menarche. So you might you might study. So I have done these things in primary menorrhea in theory session. So there are there are there are steps in the menstrual cycle. So what are the steps in the menstrual cycle? Atrinake, pubake, telake, growth pod, and finally the menarche. So there are steps: adrenal spur, pubic hair development, breast development sudden drops, then finally menarche. So there are steps, so everything is happening. So if a girl having a secondary sexual characteristic means already the process started, but it is ongoing. So if the process started, still she is not having menstrual bleeding means you can wait for further some time because uh, like you are doing ERPM this time, it's failed. Then you, we can wait for another six months for the second exam. You can wait for another six months for next exam. But still the process is going on. Do you understand? Like that. So if the girl has secondary sexual characteristic, but menstrual bleeding still not there, you can wait until 16 years. If the girl does not have secondary sexual characteristic, it means her puberty process not started yet. So then you are not supposed to wait. So you are waiting until 14 years, whether the secondary sexual characteristic started, whether the menstrual bleeding uh, uh, coming, no. So then you can, you can diagnose as primary amenorrhea. So this definition could be two, one, absence of menstrual bleeding without secondary sexual characteristic after 14 years it's primary amenorrhea right so without secondary sexual characteristic so you are not waiting further at 14 years also you can say no this process is not started so this is primary amenorrhea so girl with absence of menstrual cycle with secondary sexual characteristic it means process already started, but you are waiting for the menstrual bleeding. So you can wait further. So absence of menstrual bleeding with secondary sexual characteristic after 16 years, it's primary amenorrhea. Do you understand? Right? So even though her secondary sexual characteristic started, but after 16 years, still her final event is not happening. So you are doing final exam first, first time, second time, third time, fourth time, fifth time, sixth time. After six time, they will eliminate you because you are not eligible to become a doctor. So even though you are having secondary sexual characteristic, we are waiting until 16 years, no menstrual bleeding. Then we are labeling you as primary amenorrhea. Do you understand? So this is how we are categorizing the primary amenorrhea. So this is the definition of primary amenorrhea. So what could be the reason? The reason could be, as we know, the menstrual cycle is basically due to hypothalamus pituitary ovarian axis. So it could be a problem in the hypothalamus pituitary ovarian axis. Maybe a problem in the hypothalamus, maybe a problem in the pituitary, maybe a problem in the ovary. So if you don't have GnRH, Kalman syndrome, or pituitary tumor, pituitary radiation, pituitary infection. Without GnRH, can you have menstrual cycle? No, you can't. So problem in your hypothalamus pituitary ovarian axis. So if, it, if you have problem in the hypothalamus pituitary ovarian axis, definitely you will not have estrogen. Do you understand? Because no GnRH, without GnRH, no FSH, without FSH, there is no follicular stimulation. So without follicular stimulation, you will not have estrogen. So without estrogen, can you have secondary sexual characteristic? Can you have secondary sexual characteristic? No. So the, 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 the primary amenorrhea due to hypothalamus pituitary ovarian axis, will not have secondary sexual characteristic. 
Do you understand? Kalman syndrome. It means problem in the hypothalamus. No GnRH. Will it cause primary amenorrhea? Yes. Will they have secondary sexual characteristic? No. Do you understand why? Because there is no estrogen. Okay, Turner syndrome. What is the problem? They don't have any problem with the hypothalamus. They don't have any problem with the pituitary, but they are having problem in the ovary. Why? The ovary does not have follicle. So without ovary and follicle, yes, X no. Without ovary and follicle, can they have estrogen? No. So. Turner syndrome can cause primary amenorrhea. Yes or no? Yes. Will they have secondary sexual characteristic? No. Why? There is no estrogen. So do you understand? So you don't need to remember. Don't memorize. Just understand what is happening. So then you can simply understand the subject. So always I'm telling this oxygen guy is very difficult if you don't understand. Because this is a study of women. So you can't easily understand girls. But once you understand, it's easy to handle it. Do you understand? Right? So you have to understand. Okay. Now, the problem is you are having normal hypothalamus pituitary over an axis. Even though you are having normal pituitary over an axis, when we are saying uh, amenorrhea, if there is no vaginal bleeding, right? How the pervaginal bleeding is coming because the endometrium is shed off and bleeding is coming through the endometrium, cervical canal, vagina, and the introitus outside. So when the bleeding is coming through the outside only, you can say, yes, I have bleeding. I attain menarche. If the bleeding is not coming through this outflow tract, what will happen? You won't have menstrual bleeding. So if you have you if you don't have uterus, even though your hypothalamus pituitary over an axis, if you don't have uterus, can you have menstrual bleeding? No, because without uterus, it won't come out. There is no endometrium to shed off. Sometimes you might have uterus, but bleeding is coming, but there is an obstruction, cervical transverse cervical septum, transverse uterine septum. Transverse vaginal septum, cervical stenosis, imperforated hymen. So it means there is a problem in your outflow tract obstruction, outflow tract. So obstruction in the outflow tract. So when there is an obstruction in the outflow, the bleeding will not come. Accept it? The bleeding won't come. So here, still patient is going to complain you, I don't have menstrual bleeding. I didn't attain menarche. So what do you think about the secondary sexual characteristic for these kind of patients? Obviously, they don't have menstrual bleeding, I agree. But what do you think about the secondary sexual characteristic? Will they have? Of course, because the hypothalamus or pituitary ovary and axis is normal, but the estrogen is coming, but the bleeding couldn't come out. So the problem below the ovary will have secondary sexual characteristic, but they will have absence of menstruation. Do you understand? Do you understand? So now the special condition here is androgen insensitivity syndrome. What is androgen insensitivity syndrome? So actually that person is male, but their estrogen is not having action. Estrogen, sorry, testosterone is having not having action. Testosterone is resistant. So if there is no testosterone action, what will happen? The male secondary sexual characteristic, internal male organ will not develop. So is it possible to have menarche without secondary sexual characteristic? Usually no, right? Right. So male secondary, sec secondary sexual characteristic will not develop. So if there is no male secondary sexual characteristic, what will happen? This estrogen, so testosterone, will convert to estrogen by the hormone uh, enzyme called aromatase. Have you heard that? 
there is an enzyme called aromatase that aromatase enzyme will do the conversion of testosterone to estrogen in the peripheral fatty tissue so in peripheral fatty tissue this estrogen testosterone will convert to estrogen so even though that person is male estrogen is testosterone is not having action so no secondary sexual characteristic instead of that this testosterone is converted to estrogen so estrogen uh, concentration in the blood is also going to be high but this estrogen has action so this estrogen will convert that particular person as female when compared to normal female this person will have high level of estrogen so when when they have estrogen very well developed breast very beautiful girl but still actually she is not girl she is a boy xx xy right but unfortunately this is this is phenotypically female but as it is a phenotypically female even though it's genotypically it means genotype it's gene gene is xy so as it is xy they will not have internal female organs mullerian duct derivatives so uterus will not be there so even though they are they are beautiful girls they don't have uterus they don't have ovary they will have testis because xy testis they don't have uterus they don't have ovary they are having testis but look like a female so now you have a question how to identify them how to confirm this is a androgen insensitivity syndrome so the definitive diagnosis is you need to do the karyotyping once you do the karyotyping if it is xy female appearance definitely it's androgen insensitivity syndrome if it is xx this is a mullerian agenesis but clinically can you identify yes how to identify clinically even though uh, whether it's a male or female right this sexual hair like axillary pubic hair distribution it's mainly due to testosterone even for female pubic hair axillary hair development is due to testosterone for me male it's due to testosterone so this hair distribution is mainly by the testosterone the females also has testosterone isn't it yeah but less amount males has testosterone more amount. but we need testosterone for the pubic hair and axillary hair development so in this androgen insensitivity syndrome so now if you are a normal girl you will have normal pubic hair development why because your testosterone has action but if it is an androgen insensitivity syndrome they don't have testosterone activity without testosterone can they have pubic hair can they have uh, axillary hair yeah. so then their pubic and axillary hair distribution very very minimal so beautiful girl without pubic hair what could be the diagnosis it is androgen insensitivity syndrome so answer is a you will understand actually I, i i took some time because it's kind of difficult question so that's why i took some time okay we'll move to question number 3 a 34 year old woman with secondary amenorrhea for 2 years presented to infertility clinic her fsh level were checked 2 months apart both were 40 international unit per liter tsh prolactin uterine morphology and husband seminal fluid analysis was normal what is the best treatment for the suffertility of this couple what is the answer okay what is the diagnosis a clomiphene citrate to induce the ovulation induction what is the diagnosis primary or secondary amenorrhea right yeah very good premature ovarian failure very good 34 year old lady with 
primary secondary amenorrhea for two years what is the definition of secondary amenorrhea absence of menstruation for more than six months in a girl who had previously who had menstrual bleeding that is called secondary amenorrhea what is the commonest cause for the secondary amenorrhea is pregnancy right here this lady has secondary amenorrhea for two years so what are the causes for primary Secondary amenorrhea, as I told you, it could be a it could be like um, pregnancy or it could be a premature ovarian failure, right? So they have done the FSH. FSH was forty international units. So if the FSH is more than forty, right? If the FSH is more than forty, it is a marker of premature ovarian failure. But to confirm the premature ovarian failure, always you need to keep it in your mind. You need to do twice, at least 12 weeks apart, right? So they have done in two months apart, but you have to do it to report. Without two report, you can't simply diagnose the premature ovarian failure, okay? So this lady presented with secondary amenorrhea and they have done the FSH. The FSH revealed 40 international unit, two report, two months apart, two reports. So you can comfortably diagnose premature ovarian failure. So this is called premature ovarian failure. This is called premature ovarian failure. But the rest of the investigations are normal. TSH normal, prolactin normal, uterus normal, husband SFP normal. So she want to have a baby. She need to have a baby. So your question is, now, now you, you understood the scenario. Yeah. This lady with premature ovarian failure. What do you understand by premature ovarian failure? What do you understand by premature ovarian failure? Yeah. Kaushalya, what is premature ovarian failure? What is premature ovarian failure? What do you think? Ovaries are not matured enough. So uh, ovaries are not producing uh, eggs. Uh, very good, eggs. very good. Correct. Yeah. Very good, that's it. So it means the ovaries does not have ovarian follicle. The ovarian follicle has been depleted because the female don't have ability to produce the egg. Are they producing the egg? No. The ovaries are developing the egg. The eggs are produced during the intrauterine life. Had period of amenorrhea five weeks. Very early intrauterine life only eggs are producing. Those produced eggs will be stored in the ovary. You have a storage. Every month, this storage will be utilized for the development. That's why by 50s, your storage will be depleted and you will reach to menopause. But male does not have that one. Male will produce. Every day they are producing new sperm. So until they die, they can produce uh, sperm. So that's why you need to finish your ERPM because these days ERPM exams are happening once in a uh, year. So don't miss the exam. So finish your exams as early as possible. Before you are political study, you need to get married and get babies, isn't it? Otherwise, every time, every month, uh, when you have lockdown, you have to think not only the economy, also your follicles also depleting. Every lockdown period, we are losing the follicles. So we need to finish our ERPM as early as possible. Do you understand? Right? So because you have a limited follicles. So some girls might have a good amount of follicles. Some girls might have less amount of follicles. So depend on the follicular count, the age they reach to the menopause might vary. Here in this girl, Due to some reason, we don't know the reason. There might be infection, there might be radiation, some reason. This, uh, this girl had a very small amount of follicles. So that uh, very small amount of follicle depleted at her age of 34. 
That's why she reached to menopause at 34, premature ovarian failure. Now, you will understood she does not have any follicle for the development. So can she have baby? Can she produce the egg? Without egg, can she, can she, can she produce the uh, baby? What do you think? No, she can't have baby. So if she want to have baby, what she can do? Yes, she, had to, she has to borrow egg from someone who is having. But she has the ovary. She has the uh, uterus, right? She has the uterus. So if she has baby, we can implant the baby into her uterus and she can become pregnant. It's not a problem. But she can't have her own baby because she does not have ovum. So she need to take the ovum from someone. Then husband is normal. Husband's sperm is normal. So then what we can do, we can take the ovum from someone, take the sperm from the husband, fertilize outside. And after baby form, we can implant the baby into her uterus. So how do you call this process? This is called donor ovum with IVF and embryo transfer to this baby in vitro fertilization. So answer is donor oocyte and in vitro fertilization. Answer D. So in patient undergone hysterectomy at 40 years, if they have menopausal symptom, do we direct diagnose menopause clinically? Or do we have to take FSH and confirm? That's uh, uh, depends. So if they left the youth ovary, right? if, the, if they left the ovary, then you may have to do the uh, FSH, but uh, if they remove the ovary and having symptoms, so with the symptom, you can start a chat in only to do the FSH. Without corpus luteum, how will the baby is grown? Fantastic question. Yeah, without corpus luteum, how the baby is grown? Because what is the function of corpus luteum? Corpus luteum is giving progesterone to maintain the pregnancy. So can you give the progesterone from outside? We can. So for the IVF pregnancy, we are giving progesterone from the outside. Progesterone supplementation until the placenta form and placenta start to secrete progesterone. We have to give the hormone uh, supplement from outside. Yeah, very good. Right. Question number three, answer D. Question number four, a 40 year old woman with BMI of 32 referred her to the gynecology clinic with secondary amenorrhea. She has two children and her partner has uh, had a vasectomy five years ago, an ultrasound scan performed, which shows normal uterus with endometrial thickness of six millimeter. Both ovary have typical polycystic appearance. What would be the recommended management? What would be the recommended management? Very good. Very good. Yes. Here, this is a secondary amenorrhea. What is secondary amenorrhea? The absence of menstruation for more than six months. So husband also undergone vasectomy, it means uh, the becoming pregnancy is uh, uh, less likely. So this secondary amenorrhea, it's less likely to be due to pregnancy. So her BMI is 32, she's obese. So these are the problems. So 40 years, obese and secondary amenorrhea. The ultrasound scan, it's uh, PCOS. So she's having amenorrhea due to PCOS. So it means she does not have menstrual bleeding for more than six months due to PCOS. So what is your worry here? So of course you need to treat this PCOS. There is no question. So what is the best treatment for the PCOS is weight reduction. So once you ask the patient to reduce the weight, the menstrual bleeding will uh, resume and ovulation will resume. So then the problem will settle down. So what you have to do is you have to ask her to wait to do, so do the weight reduction exercise and diet. But before that, as this lady does not have menstrual bleeding for a long time, this endometrium is exposed to estrogen for more than six months. Isn't it? If it is an amenorrhea for six months means this endometrium is exposed to estrogen continuously with without a breakdown for more than six months. What is your worries? If the endometrium is exposed to estrogen for a long time, what is your worries? Very good. Proliferation can be cancer. Very good. 
so endometrial hyperplasia and finally it can cause uh, uh, endometrial malignancy ca so that's why what you want to do you want to expose you want to break down this endometrium and give the progestin and protect the endometrium that would be the first management then you can ask her to do the weight reduction, metformin, all kind of management. So here, this patient, what would be the recommended management? First of all, you need to give induced three-monthly withdrawal bleeding with progesterone. So what is the management for the lean body PCOS? We have to give uh, OCP. Because in lean body PCOS, it's basically due to LH predominant stage. So you need to suppress the uh, pituitary. So for that, uh, you have to give OCP for maybe three to six months as they are lean. So no point in reducing the weight actually, right? Because if it's an obese PCOS, yes. Lean body, no. So then you have to give OCP for three to six months. So then you can suppress the pituitary, then LH secretion will come down. So then uh, the menstrual cycle will be normal. So answer the, 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 the management is P OCP for three to six months. All right, okay. So answer induced three monthly withdrawal bleeding with progesterone B. Right. Question number five. A gravida four para three is admitted in preterm labor at 36 plus five days. A gravida four para three is admitted in preterm labor at 36 plus five days. She is known to have polyhydramniosis, but relevant antenatal investigation, relevant antenatal investigations have been normal. An ultrasound scan at 36 week gastration had uh, revealed the estimated fetal weight just below 10 centile. On examination, cervix was four centimeter dilated with intact membrane, high presenting part. Five minutes after the admission, there is a spontaneous rupture of membrane, CTG source, fetal body cardiac. What need to be excluded by prompt vaginal examination? Hot prolapse. Hot prolapse. Hot prolapse. Good. Yes, cord prolapse. So why you are thinking cord prolapse? So you need to identify the prompt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But oh, yeah, very good. Tell me what are the reason why you are thinking this high station, collapse? high station, high station is very high and polyhydramnosis. Okay. Preterm pre 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 member. member. Very good. Very good. Very good. There are there are uh, there are reason. Give me one minute. I'll change the. Yeah, why do you think it's cord flap? Hello? PPROM? Yeah, one, it is a PPROM, preterm, preterm, pre labor rupture of membrane. That is one. Second, baby is smaller. Third one is polyhydramnios. Fourth one, head is high head, head is not engaged. When the head is not engaged into the pelvis, right, the pelvic rim will not be sealed and high amount of lipo. When the membrane got ruptured with polyatomiosis, when suddenly the, the, the lipo is coming out along with the lipo, the coat might come easily. So this mother has, there are four risk factors for the coat collapse. IGGR, preterm, high head, polyatomiosis. So considering these risk factors, once the membrane got ruptured, she is developing uh, fetal body cardia. So then there is no question. You are suspecting cord collapse. It could be, it should be a cord collapse. So you have to do the speculum examination or vaginal examination to exclude the cord collapse. Right? So it is a straightforward question once you identify the problem. So answer is C. Right. So there was a question somebody asked in... Um, In this chat, sir, it is a live class or recording. What is the answer? Like. Thank you very much. 
so even couldn't identify whether it's a live class or recording so actually i have started class at 8:30 you know not not at 6 am so you are not in the, maybe a saturday no night policy so still not uh, coming out from yesterday party please so my students should be a rational person right okay so question number 6 a primary gravida at 32 weeks of period of gestation with fgr and oligohydramnios what is the most appropriate next step of uh, step in management so primary 32 weeks fgr and oligohydramnios what is the most appropriate next step in management right okay so if it is an igugr fgr fetal growth restriction so as we studied earlier we know what is fetal growth restriction the baby is inside the uterus baby has some kind of distress and baby is not getting enough oxygen supply and the nutritional supply that's why fetal growth is restricted so the intrauterine environment is not good for that particular baby so if you keep this baby inside what will happen baby might uh, having hypoxia and it can it can lead to a iud that is your worry right but still as it is 32 weeks if you take the baby because of the hypoxia outside what will happen because of the prematurity baby will now you have a problem so is it okay to keep the baby or is it okay to deliver the baby because for the igug you don't have nothing to do it because if the oxygen supply through the placenta is less you can't do much only thing what you can do you can assess are you going to take the baby out or are you going to keep the baby inside because when you keep the baby inside every day baby is getting matured every day baby is getting matured so if you can keep this baby if you can track the pregnancy until 37 weeks then baby is okay baby does not have any prematurity issues but because of the hypoxia if you deliver the baby bit early baby will develop prematurity and die but you are you are you are your your problem is if you if you keep the baby inside also it will be a problem why because baby has hypoxia so what are you going to do so risk and benefit balance the risk and benefit and assess the baby you need to assess whether is it okay to keep the baby inside or do you want to take the baby out that is your worry so you are assessing whether baby is getting at least enough oxygen supply so then the fetal surveillance is the only way of management for igugr you are surveillance you are doing the surveillance you are monitoring the baby whether the baby is okay whether the baby is getting enough oxygen supply whether the baby is doing good so how to do the fetal surveillance you do the scan every 2 weeks you do scan when you do the scan you can see whether the baby is gaining the weight whether the baby's weight is increasing if the baby is not gaining the weight is it useful to keep the baby no it's not useful to keep the baby no point in keeping the baby so you can deliver the baby do you understand right so you can simply you can simply deliver the baby so you are doing the ultrasound scan to assess the fetal weight that is one second you can assess the like hormone is the baby having severe oligohydramniosis it is causing compression so if the baby also developing kind of fetal distress then you can think about the delivery third one you need to assess whether baby is getting enough blood flow from the placenta how to assess whether baby is getting enough flow to the placenta by the umbilical artery doppler if the umbilical artery doppler is abnormal obviously you know there is a problem with the oxygen supply from the placenta placental blood flow is not good so then you can think about the delivery if the placental blood flow is okay still you have to check whether the baby is having hypoxia how to assess the hypoxia then you can check the middle cerebral artery so first of all we do umbilical artery if umbilical artery abnormal you can think about the delivery if the umbilical artery normal so could be normal but oxygen amount might be less then how to assess the oxygen amount then you have to do the middle cerebral artery if normal umbilical artery then you need to do the middle cerebral artery if middle cerebral artery also normal of course you know there is a restriction but still baby is doing well then you can continue the pregnancy if anything is abnormal then you can think about the delivery right so we don't do routinely ctg because ctg will say the acute hypoxic event not the chronic hypoxic event 
when there is a cord compression, when there is an acute hypoxia, CTG will have some kind of abnormalities. Yes, and also has false positive rate as well. So the CTG will be used for the acute hypoxia, but for the chronic hypoxia, you can identify through the ultrasound scan, umbilical artery Doppler, as well as the middle cerebral artery Doppler. So we do middle cerebral artery Doppler. We do middle cerebral artery Doppler when there is an a normal umbilical artery doctor. So here they have mentioned prime, primary mother with 32 weeks of period of castration. If GR and oligohydrogen, what is the next step of management? Measure umbilical artery doctor flow to assess whether umbilical blood flow is normal. If the umbilical flow is normal, then what is the next step? Do middle cerebral artery. So answer is C. Question number seven. The primary is induced for suspected fetal growth restriction with prostaglandin. The sympathy of funnel height is only 33 centimeters at 38 weeks. And series of scans suggest crossing of abdominal circumference and ties. Although lyco volume and umbilical artery Doppler recordings are normal range. The membrane are ruptured artificially at 2 cm and syntocinone started. Within an hour, she is contracting regularly 3 to 4 every 10 minutes and the further examination of uh, examination three hours after this shows she is three centimeter dilated a further three hours later you are asked to review the situation because the midwife has concern about the ctd you find baseline rate of 155 previously it was 135 Variability of less than 5 for 50 minutes and typical variable deceleration for last two hours occurring with majority of the contraction. On examination, you found her to be 4 cm dilated with 1 cm thick cervix and meconium stained lyco. She has ketonuria and requesting more pain relief, having so far received codeine. Which of the following option would be the most appropriate course of action? I know when you read the question, when you finish the question, you might forget the, the, the first sentence. What was it? So B, C, D, all kind of answers are coming. Sir, wrong labor, the turn of the synthesinol. Wrong labor. Okay. Turn of the synthesinol and give turbidity and recommended epidural. Why you want to stop the contraction? Mm. If, she has, if, if she has... If she has... Uh, hyperstimulation, what is the contraction amount? Three to four. What is your ideal it's contraction normal. during the labor? Three to five for 10 minutes. Uh, three to five. So is it normal or excessive? Normal. It's normal. Normal. But normal. Then we don't need to do uh, uh, that part, right? So here, what are the problem you need to identify? So they might say a lot of stuff, but you need to identify the important key points. So this patient is having uh, small for gestational age and uh, the scan is crossing the 10 centile, something centile. So what is the, what is the summary of that? It is IGR baby. IGR. Yes, IGR baby. Yeah, IUGR baby. Are you, all, are you all happy with that? This is an IUGR baby. The first problem I identified, this is an IUGR baby. Even though it's an IUGR baby, AFI and LICO is normal. Are you all happy with that? Yes. Right. Second, because of the IUGR, they wanted to deliver this baby a bit early. That's why they have induced with artificial rupture of membrane and syntocinone has been started. It's an early induction due to IUGR. So the second problem, it is an IOL in IOL induction of labor. So IUGR and IOL has high risk. So this labor is a high risk labor on labor room, in labor room. Okay. 
she is getting enough contraction, three to four contraction in 10 minutes. All right, okay. So she is in labor, she is getting enough contraction and initially she was two centimeter, now she is four centimeter. So what you understand by this, earlier three centimeter, now four centimeter, now only she entered into the active stage of labor. Earlier it was, it was in latent phase. Now the labor is progressing and she's entering into the active phase. So you are happy, this labor is good, progressing. But the problem is it's a high risk labor because it's IgGR and an induction of labor. So now the midwife is telling to you, doctor, there is a problem with the CTG. What are the problem in the CTG? It is reduced variability for 50 minutes. So reduced variability and up to 40 minutes is normal. From 40 minutes to 90 minutes, it's a non-reassuring feature. 40 minutes to uh, uh, 90 minutes, it's non-reassuring feature. Reduce variability more than 90 minutes is abnormal. So we studied during the CTG class, right? So there are non-reassuring feature, there are abnormal feature. So when you categorize the CTG, if somebody have abnormal, one abnormal feature, you will take that one as abnormal CTG. When somebody have two non-reassuring feature, you will take that CTG as abnormal CTG. So there are features, depend on the features, you can categorize the CTG, whether it's abnormal or it's suspicious. So one abnormal feature, then you can categorize as abnormal CTG. One non-reassuring feature, you are categorizing as suspicious CTG. If there is two non-reassuring feature, then straight away you can categorize as abnormal CTG. So here, her reduced variability is 50 minutes, means more than 40 minutes, still less than 90 minutes. So this is called non-reassuring feature. She is having one non-reassuring feature. Second one, she is having variable deceleration for more than two hours. Typical variable deceleration more than 90 minutes. Typical variable de deceleration more than 90 minutes. It's another non-reassuring feature. So she's having two non-reassuring features. So what do you think about this CTG? What is the category of CTG? Normal CTG, suspicious CTG, abnormal CTG. What do you think about this CTG? Abnormal CTG. Abnormal CTG. Why it is abnormal CTG? Because she's having two non-reassuring features. So this IgGR baby with abnormal CTG. I will, I will agree with that. So when there is a IgGR, already baby is restricted and now abnormal CTG, then of course you know there is a problem to the baby. If it is an abnormal CTG, as we know, the CTG does not have good sensitivity to identify the fetal hypoxia. Mostly it could be false positive. So if it is an abnormal CTG, you are suspecting baby might have hypoxia, but CTG is not that much sensitive investigation. Baby might not have hypoxia as well. So we are not believing 100% that the CTG. So then what we do, if it is an abnormal CTG, what we do, we do the fetal blood sampling to check the acidotic status to the baby. So that is the next step. When there is an abnormal CTG, we do fetal skull blood sampling, right? So in this patient, IgGR with abnormal CTG, what are you going to do next? You may have to do the fetal skull blood sampling, but read the question carefully further. When the vaginal examination, there is a meconium stain lyco. What do you understand by meconium stain lyco? What is meconium stain lyco? What is meconium? Feces. Uh, Feces. So, stool. yes, stool. Yes. This baby has passed the stool. Why this baby passed the stool? Baby because is stressed. Peter baby, distress. Yes, baby is in distress. Because as we know, this bubble opening is maintained by the vagal nerve, isn't it? Vagal nerve is responsible for the bowel opening. So please try to understand each and everything from the basic. Why is meconium stain? 
So I used to teach like this. So please try to understand. So bowel opening is due to vagal nerve stimulation. So when there is a fetal distress, the heart rate can't be higher. So to protect the heart, what will happen? The baby's nervous system will stimulate the vagal side. To reduce the heart rate, to reduce the workload of the heart, because already baby is having hypoxia. So when there is a distress, what will happen? The vagal nerve activity will stimulate and heart rate will come down. So when there is a vagal stimulation, what will happen to the fetus bowel movement? Bowel will open. So then baby will pass the feces. So if it is a Meconium stain that is indicating fetal distress. That is an evidence. So why we are doing this fetal scalp blood sampling to assess whether I can keep this baby for some time to progress, or do I want to take the baby out? Whether the baby is acidotic or not, that is the aim. But here, in addition to the CTG, you have another evidence saying baby is really under distress. What is that evidence? Is meconium. So already baby is compromised. This is an IGUDR baby, compromised baby. We know baby has some kind of pre-existing long-lasting hypoxia. Now CTG also showing the baby is having kind of distress and also baby is giving another evidence by passing the meconium. So can you comfortably say this baby is having distress right now? Yes. So as this baby passing meconium and abnormal CTG, we are not going to do the fetal skull blood sample. So you, you can't keep this baby further inside because baby might die. So you need to take the baby out. So you need to take the baby out. How can you take the baby out at four centimeter? You need to do the cesarean section. So what kind of cesarean section? Are you going to do category one cesarean section or category two cesarean section? What is category one cesarean section? You need to deliver the baby within 30 minutes. What is category two cesarean section? You need to deliver the baby within 70 minutes. What kind of delivery you need to do for this patient? 10 minutes, so it have to take it through. You can wait until 70 minutes. So there are a few instances only you need to do category one cesarean section because baby has ability to withstand the hypoxia for some extent. So if it is a cord prolapse, if it is a placental abruption, if it is a fetal uh, 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 this uh, prolonged deceleration, if it is a uterine rupture, it means baby has abrupt hypoxia. There is no recovery. Here, baby has distress agree but there is no continuous hypoxia so then you don't need to do within 30 minutes you can do it within 70 minutes so this baby need category 2 cesarean section so answer is b proceed to category 2 cesarean section so now you might understand doing exam paper it's not as not easy as you think Okay, so each and every words you need to process in your brain, then only you need to come to the answer. You need to know why you are selecting this answer. Don't worry, we will, I will, I will, I will guide you. Right, so then you know how to, how to come to the correct answer. Right, so answer is B. Question number eight. A gravid 2, para 1, book for Loris midwivery care presented uh, Loris, uh, right, okay, before coming to this question, somebody has a question. Sir, here the baby has more than two hours deceleration. Can we put it into category 1? Right, okay, so uh, I think I will do the emergency uh, restreaming uh, from next day, so if you already attended, please uh, 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 just go to the uh, CTG features because it's easy uh, because uh, you might uh, recall your, you can recall your uh, CTG, you might forget those things. Now, this variable decelerations are not causing fetal death or fetal brain damage immediately. So you can wait until 90 minutes to say it's an abnormal feature. 
Do you understand? If it is a variable deceleration, we are waiting for one and a half hours to say this is an abnormal feature. It means having variable deceleration for one and a half hours will not harm to the baby. So we are not worrying much. So here it is two hours variable deceleration means, of course, it's deceleration, two hours, but it is not going to harm to the baby immediately. But if it is a prolonged deceleration, means baby is having hypoxia continuously. Variable deceleration means baby is having hypoxia, then recovering normal, then, then deceleration, recovering normal, deceleration, recovering normal. So during the contraction, baby is getting hypoxia, relaxation, baby is getting oxygen. So it means baby does not have continuous hypoxia. Baby is getting oxygen and hypoxia, oxygen and hypoxia. It means baby couldn't withstand the uterine contraction. When there is a contraction, baby is getting hypoxia. Rest of the time, baby is okay. So you don't need to be hurry to deliver within 30 minutes. Why? What is the practical problem to deliver within 30 minutes? Category 1 cesarean section means, so if the theater is ready, then you can do within 30 minutes. Within 70 minutes, it's category 2. So if it is category 1 cesarean section means, say for example, you want to do the cesarean section, you are taking the patient to, uh, uh, you are taking the patient to the, Theater, when you are going to the theater, there is another cesarean section is going on. What are you going to do? If it is a category one cesarean section, you need to open a new theater and do the section. That much of urgent. Right? If the theater is available, you can do it. But if not, you have to open a new theater. That much of urgent. But for this patient, are you going to open a new theater and do the section? Or are you going to wait until fin finish that ongoing theater, cesarean section? You can wait until that, that ongoing section is uh, finished. But you are not waiting until the uh, uh, fasting completed. So sometimes she might uh, might not complete the fasting. So it might be two hours. Then you are, you are not going to wait another four hours to complete the fasting. You are not worrying about the fasting. You are delivering within 70 minutes. It's me. It doesn't mean you have to wait until 70 minutes and deliver. You can wait maximum 70 minutes. Within 70 minutes, you need to take this baby out. But if it is a category one means within 30 minutes, anyhow, you need to take the baby out. If the theater is not available, open a new theater and do it. Do you understand? Is it that much of urgent? No, this is not that much of urgent. Open a new theater and deliver it. No. Yeah, maternal ketonuria, it's not a problem. You can give a eye fluid and it will be all right. Right. Question number eight, a primary gravida two, oh, sorry, a gravida two, para one, book for low risk midwifery care at 38 weeks with diminished fetal movement for 48 hours. Fetal heart rate was uh, undetectable and sadly intrauterine fetal death was confirmed with an ultrasound scan. Mother would prefer to go home and return 24 hours later for induction after arranging the children for her other uh, child care for her other child. Her blood group uh, is Rh negative. What would be? What would you advise? Answer C. Answer C. Advise Clehova test to detect the fetal maternal hemorrhage and allow go home. Okay. Any other answers? Answer B. Answer B. Okay. Right now, here, this mother admitted with reduced fetal movement and ultrasound scan confirm IUD. So this is an IOD, right? So you are assessing uh, some factors. She's an RH negative. So RH negative mother with IOD, then the problem, what is your problem is when the baby is dying, there will be a fetal maternal hemorrhage, right? So if it is a live baby, when will be the fetal maternal hemorrhage occur? When the baby is delivering. Right. For the live baby, the fetal blood enter into the maternal circulation when the baby is delivering only. But for the IUD baby, the fetal maternal hemorrhage will occur not during the labor. It is during the IUD. So to prevent the sensitization, what we do, we have to give the rogam as well as have to do the Clehova test. So for the live baby, when are we going to give this uh, rogam? Within 72 hours of delivery. 
because we know the fetal maternal hemorrhage will occur in 72 hours, within 72 hours of the delivery. But for the IUD, this fetal maternal hemorrhage will occur within 72 hours of IUD. Now, if it is an IUD, you don't need to be hurry to deliver the baby. See, this mother want to go home and she need to arrange the child care for the previous baby who is in the home. So you can let her to go home and come back. It's not a problem. But before you send her home, you need to give the rogum to prevent the sensitization because already fetal maternal hemorrhage occurred. Unlikely for the live baby, for the IUD baby, you need to give the rogum immediately after the IUD, not after the delivery. Do you understand? If it is a live baby, after the delivery only we give. For the IUD, after the IUD, you have to give before, not before the delivery, not after the delivery. Okay. So this patient is um, having IUD and she wanted to go home. Yes, you can send her home, but you have to do the Klehova and Rogam and you can send her to go, go home. So answer is B. Question number nine. A 32 year old Gravit 2 para 1 has been transferred from midwivery led unit for lack of progression in labor at four centimeter. Her previous baby weighed 3.1 gram and was normal delivery at 38 weeks on admission. The observations are normal and CTG were reassuring. The midwife who examined her has diagnosed complete representation and this is confirmed on scan. The woman is very keen to have vaginal delivery and decision has been taken to allow the labor to continue. After two hours, there is no progression in the labor. And CTG, has become suspicious. What is the most appropriate action? Breach uh, prolonged. So we have to do uh, emergency cesarean section. Okay. Right. So, so the routine uh, recommendation for the breach delivery is we don't allow the vaginal breach delivery because it has it has fetal complication. So what we do, we do EV or we can do cesarean section. This is the recommendation. But if the patient willing to go for a vaginal delivery, especially she had a previous vaginal delivery, after explanation, you can go for a vaginal breach delivery, right? But the person who is in the labor room to look after the labor should be able to deliver the vaginal breech delivery. That is the first important part. Do you understand? Right. So here this patient wanted to go for a vaginal delivery. So they also allowed to go for a vaginal delivery. But unfortunately, after two hours, labor is not progressing, lack of progression. If the vaginal delivery is not progressing, Delivery is not progressing. What are we going to do? Are we going to do the fetal scalp blood sampling? So keep it in your mind. Fetal scalp blood sampling or fetal blood sampling is not recommended for breach delivery. You are not taking the fetal scalp sampling for the breach delivery. If it is a lack of progression, that's there are controversy for starting syndosinone because RCOG is recommending not to start and NICE is recommending start. So there are controversy. Usually we don't start syndosinone for uh, breach deliveries. So if it is a lack of progression, you don't have any other option. You need to go for a cesarean section. Because as we know, for the breach delivery, recommendation is cesarean section. But if the patient requested for the vaginal delivery, we give the chance. A rile of labor. When the rile of labor is getting delayed, are we going to do further intervention? No, because it's a rile, trial failed. Are you going to wait further? No. We go for cesarean section, simple. So advice, emergency cesarean section. That is the answer. A. Question number 10. A 32-year-old mother delivered her first twin vaginal, uh, first twin vaginally. Birth weight is 2.6 kilo. Sir, can't do an ECV or internal podalic version. Okay. I think I have told this one earlier. 
internal podalic version and breech extraction is only for second baby of the twin delivery never ever for singleton pregnancy those kind of things always you need to keep it in your mind internal podalic version and breech extraction is only for the second twin of the, the second baby of the twin pregnancy not for singleton and for easy v you can do before labor start and membrane should be intact already they have induced the labor membrane rupture then you can't do membrane should be intact and before starting the labor only you can do once the labor start you can't do because when the uterus is contracting you can't turn the baby so easy v or internal version is not possible for this patient okay thank you right a 32 year old mother delivered her first twin vaginally birth weight is 2. Point, uh, uh, 2.6 kilogram. Second twin is in breech presentation on vaginal examination. Coat is felt and is pulsating. Breach is felt. What is the next step of management? Cord collapse. Cord collapse. Emergency cesarean section. Okay. Right. I agree you are half answer. It is a cord collapse. Yeah, I agree. Because uh, the cord pulsation. So it is a cord collapse. So if it is a cord collapse, what is your management? Nature's position and feel the cell line. Uh, no, 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 no. What uh, is your what do you want to do? If it is a cord collapse, expedite the delivery. You need to take the baby immediately. Yes or no? Answer me. Yes or no? Yes. Yes, you need to expedite the delivery. That is your aim, okay? Right. If it is a Catholic presentation, fully dilated, coat collapse, you need to take the baby immediately. What you can do? Emergency, uh, forceps delivery? Yeah, forceps or vacuum. Forceps. Put the instrument and take the baby out. Yeah, you can expedite. Agree? Yes. Yeah. If it is six centimeter, coat collapse, can you do instrument delivery? No, we can't. It's not dilated, fully dilated. So then what is your management? Uh, we can do emergency uh, emergency. You don't have option. You have to cut and take the baby immediately. So then cesarean section. Okay. Here, this is, uh, okay. I'm asking singleton pregnancy, breech presentation, six centimeter dilated, cord collapse. What is your management? Six centimeter dilated. Emergency cesarean section. Emergency cesarean section. Singleton pregnancy, breech presentation, fully dilated, cord collapse. What is your management? Uh, forceps delivery. For the breech? Uh, ex uh, external uh, uh, breech extraction. Breech vaginal delivery. I, I just I told you for the singleton pregnancy you can't do breech extraction. You can't do breech extraction for a singleton pregnancy. So breech extraction is not possible. So if you want to go for a, a vaginal breech delivery, you need to wait. You can't do the expedition of the delivery. So if you want to expedite the delivery, even though it's fully dilated, if it is a breech presentation. You don't have any other option. You need to come for a cesarean. Agree? Yeah. Yeah. But if it is a twin pregnancy, already first twin delivered, second twin collapse, but it's breach. You need to take the baby immediately. What you can do? Breach extraction, ECV. No need ECV. Breach extraction, ECV. We have to turn and wait for the normal delivery. No, now the breach is lower. You need to take the baby immediately. It, as it is a twin pregnancy, already first baby delivered, what you can do, you can catch the baby's leg and pull the baby out. Next minute, baby will be outside. Yeah. Do you understand that? Yes, so here, yeah, here, what are, yeah, here, what are the problem you identified here is a 
22 year, 32 years, first twin delivered vaginally. So it is a twin delivery. It's 32 years, first twin delivered vaginally. So it means uh, uh, these are the information you need to understand here. One is uh, uh, already uh, already one baby delivered. You could feel the coat pulsation. It means coat prolapse, right? It is a coat prolapse and breach is felt. Of course, it is a breach presentation with coat prolapse, fully dilated. Why it is fully dilated? Already one baby delivered, fully dilated. So as it is a coat prolapse, you need to deliver the baby, expedite the delivery. So how can you expedite the delivery? Just pull the baby out, breach extraction, because you can do the breach extraction for twin pregnancy. So answer is B, perfect breach extraction. Okay, are you all clear? Okay, right? Great. Shall we move to MCQ? Right, MCQ. Recognize, sir, what about the risk of thromboembolism in IUD? Yeah, actually, the thromboembolism risk and more than the thromboembolism, the risk of DIC is a bit high in IUD. But even though it's IUD, the uh, uh, DIC risk is more than 30 percentage after three weeks. So you don't need to be hurry to deliver once you diagnose immediately. You can wait. It's not uh, then urgent, that much urgent. Only the DIC risk will increase after three weeks, not immediately. Okay. So, but they are asking the next step. So can't we take the answer A? What is the answer? Fill the bladder with normal cell. Why? What is the point of filling the bladder? So why we are filling the bladder? If you want to transfer the patient to the theater, you need some time. Until that, you need to uh, reduce the cord compression. That's why you are filling the bladder. Here, are you going to wait? No, you just put the, if you fill the bladder, can you pu to push the baby out? No, you can't. So no point in filling the bladder. Right? So you, the purpose, you should know why you are filling the bladder. The filling the bladder is, uh, oh my God, macrobot position. So the, the purpose of filling the bladder is to release the cord compression by the presenting part until you take the baby mother to the labor or the theater. If you are delaying until you do the action, you need to release the actual compression. Yeah, of course, actually, I'm really sorry why I didn't give the uh, 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 YouTube link is I plan to give my all three videos through my uh, uh, platform. So it is getting delayed because uh, we are waiting for the Apple uh, application uh, because we have submitted. They didn't uh, give the access. They are taking time. That's why I couldn't do that. So once once we get the Apple uh app we can because now if i i can give now but the problem is only the students who are having uh android so the android only can access uh, my platform so then i don't want to do that so i'm waiting for the apple application as well so once i get the apple application i will uh, give all these uh, free videos as well as all the all the courses which i have done to you like uh, even the foundation course everything will be available so almost all are automated. You can do whatever you want. You can join to the live session. You can whatever. You, I'll, I'll, I'll explain you once the platform is available. So in IUD, if the Klehova test um, uh, was negative, do we still give Rogam before sending her home? Uh, what is Klehova test? Klehova test is to identify the fetal blood. Right? So first of all, you need to know the regime how to give the rogum to a rh negative mother right so this is the regime what we do if it is a uh, fetal maternal hemorrhage event if it is a fetal maternal hemorrhage event before 20 weeks we have to give 250 international unit rogum and you don't need to do the clehova because before 20 weeks, maximum amount of fetal maternal hemorrhage could happen is 
just two milliliter. So if you give uh, 250 international unit, that will neutralize completely your fetal hemorrhage. Do you understand? But if you are going to uh, give the rogam after 20 weeks, you have to give 500 international unit that will neutralize 4 milliliter. Same time we do Clehova. So then Clehova will say, what is the amount of blood which has entered from the fetal circulation to matter circulation? So if it is 8 milliliter, already you have neutralized 4 milliliter, then you need to give another additional 500 international unit because 1 milliliter of fetal blood will be neutralized by 125 international unit of proba. To neutralize 1 milliliter of feto, fetal blood, you have to give 125 international unit of proba. So definitely there will be a, a, a fetomaternal hemorrhage. So before you do the Clehova, we give 500 and do Clehova, right? So we do both together, right? So we are not waiting until the Clehova report comes to give the rogam. We just give 500 and do Clehova. Then depend on the Clehova test, then we need to decide whether we want to give the additional dose or not, right? Okay, so question one, MCQ question number. So if the baby is single transcephalic and fully dilated centimeter, Port plugs can we go for instrumental delivery? Yes, come on. That's what we discussed, right? If it is a Catholic presentation, fully dilated, you can go for instrumental delivery because rather than taking her to the theater and give anesthesia and cut and take the baby, it's take time. Rather than doing that, just put the instrument and take the baby. That will be the fastest way. Isn't it? That will be the fastest way to deliver the baby. Right. In the government sector. So do, do we do anomaly te antibody test in government sector? Yeah, of course we are doing. How long will it take to get the Clehova test results? Actually in Sri Lanka, the Clehova test is not available. So that's why what we do, we give 1,500 international unit arbitrarily because we don't have Clehova test. So if you want to do the Clehova test, you have to send the blood sample to the NARA amputee, then only you will get a few tertiary center might have. So that we can't we can't uh, uh, do that Clehova test freak, uh, freak, uh, very very easily in Sri Lanka, but in Western world you can get it in maybe in six hours. If it is not available in the situation, how do we do it, sir? We are we are, we are not doing the Clehova. We just give thousand five hundred international unit, assuming the maximum amount of fetal blood to enter to the maternal circulation is twelve milliliter. Almost 99% of uh, mothers will have less than 12 milliliters. So if you give 1,500, it will neutralize entire blood. But still, 1% of mothers might have more than 12 milliliters. Those kind of mothers, still even after giving the rogum, still the fetal blood will be there. That can stimulate. That can sensitize the mother. There is a small risk, but unfortunately, we don't have Clehova test in Sri Lanka. Freely available. We have, but it's not freely available. So why do we do the antibody test if we are uh, anyway giving rogam? No, antibody test why we are doing is to identify whether mother is already sensitized or not. Why we are giving rogam is to identify, uh, is to prevent the rogam, prevent the sensitization. So antibody test will help us to identify whether she already sensitized or not. So in the breach cesarean section for fully dilatation, not re, so in the breach, is cesarean section for full dilatation or not full dilatation? I, I, I couldn't understand this question. Can you please elaborate the question? What is the management of breach presentation with court players? Oh my God. I'll give the video recording. Please just go through it. Right. So we will go to the MCQ. Uh, recognize cause for the primary amenorrhea. Of course, we have discussed about the primary, primary amenorrhea causes. So it could be a problem with the hypothalamus pituitary over an axis, or it could be a problem in the outflow tract obstruction. So Turner syndrome, true or false? What do you think? It's false. true. False. Turner syndrome. Turner syndrome means there is no follicle. So without follicle, can you have estrogen? Can you have menstrual bleeding? In Turner syndrome, their chromosome is X naught. If it is an X naught, 
there won't be any follicles in the ovary, streaky ovary. Without follicle, can you have follicular development? No. Can you have estrogen? No. Can you have secondary characteristic? No. Can you have menstrual bleeding? No. So then, in the primary amenorrhea without secondary sexual characteristic. Right? So it's uh, true. Recognize cause for the primary amenorrhea? It's true. Right. Second, second stem, adult PCOS. Who? Adult P. What is adult P? The PCOS in the adult means already she had a menstrual baby. PCOS can cause amenorrhea, but it's in the later life. So it means already she had a menstrual cycle. Now she's having amenorrhea. So then it is secondary amenorrhea. So adult PCOS can cause secondary amenorrhea, not the primary amenorrhea. Primary amenorrhea is absence of menstruation in her life. She never had menstrual bleeding. But PCOS usually causes secondary amenorrhea. Adult PCOS is commonly caused for secondary amenorrhea. So, so it's if it is only PCOS, we can take it as true. Sorry? Uh, we, if we don't mention like uh, mention like adult, we don't mention adult I, just because we can it, uh, take it as true. Just like that, the P cause is cause for the secondary amenorrhea. Very very negligible amount only. So you can't you can't find the uh, uh, secondary primary amenorrhea with P cause. It's usually we can say false. So P cause is not a cause for the primary amenorrhea, very, very rarely it can cause. So you don't need to take it as true for the primary amenorrhea, amenorrhea cause uh, as a, a P cause. Okay, right. Mullerian agenesis? True, primary amenorrhea. Primary amenorrhea, right. Because Mullerian agenesis means the Mullerian duct is responsible for the development of female uterus, fallopian tube, and uh, cervix and the upper part of the vagina. So if it is a Mullerian agenesis, these structures will not be developed. There is no tubes, no uterus, no cervix, no upper part of vagina. So without uterus, can they have menstrual bleeding? No. So then, so then Mullerian agenesis can cause amenorrhea. What do you think about the secondary sexual characteristics? Will be there or will not be there? Because over, ovary is not affected, not follicle affected, we can have secondary uh, sexual yeah, characteristics. They don't have any problem in their hypothalamus or pituitary ovary axis. Their ovaries are normal. The ovaries are producing uh, estrogen. So they will have secondary sexual characteristics, but they will not have menstrual bleed. So primary amenorrhea with secondary sexual characteristic for the Mullerian age. Very good. Now you understood. Then you can simply ask. Right, good. Testicular feminism. It's true. True. True, right? So, because already we have discussed testicular feminization syndrome, they don't have uterus, they don't have ovary, but they look a they look like female, they don't have bleeding. So, that's true. Ashaman syndrome. Is secondary amenorrhea false? False. It is secondary. What is Ashaman syndrome? It's like uh, dilatation and curettage can uh, uh, damage uterine adhesions. And what is Ashaman syndrome is uterine adhesion and uterine endometrial fibrosis. Why it causes fibrosis of the endometrial cavity? You are damaging the endometrial cavity, like as you said, DNC, ERPC, infection. Right. So during that, you are damaging the endometrium. When you damage the endometrium, those damaged endometrium will replace by the fibrous tissue. This fibrous tissue will not have ability to um, uh, shed off and bleed. Right? Fibrous tissue will not have ability to shed off and bleed. So Ashaman syndrome can cause secondary amenorrhea, not the primary amenorrhea. So answer for question number one, two, four, two, two, false. Adenomyces is commonly seen in Paris women. Adenomyces is common in multiparous women. Yeah, of course, it's true because uterus is enlarged. When the uterus is enlarged, 
due to the dependency that the impulse is enlarging. As we know, uh, what will happen? There is a, there is a uh, barrier in between the endometrium and biometrium, endomometrial junction. This junction will prevent this endometrium to invade into the myometrium. But when the woman become pregnant, when the uterus is distending, right, this endomyometrial junction will get uh, damaged, so weakened. So when the endomyometrial junction get weakened, this endometrium can easily enter into the myometrium and it causes adenomyosis. It causes adenomyosis, right? It causes adenomyosis. So commonly seen is Paris woman. Yeah, that's true. Causes subfertility. Adenomyosis can cause subfertility. True or false? True. True. Because when the material is uh, in pain, then the risk of uh, miscarriage is a bit high. So it can cause uh, subfertility. So implantation might affect. Yeah, it can be a cause for the subfertility. That's true. Causes intermensural spotting. It can cause intermensural spotting. True. Because here the problem is when the endometrium entered into the myometrium, right? During the mensural cycle, the endometrium which is present inside the myometrium also will proliferate and shed off. So what will happen? There will be a bleeding into the myometrium. Okay. There is a bleeding into the myometrium. So when you have a bleeding into the myometrium, you will have severe pain. So it can cause dysmenorrhea. When you have endometrial shed off into the myometrium, what will happen? It will stimulate the inflammation because mensural cycle is an inflammatory process. So it will stimulate the inflammation. So myometrium will be inflamed. Because of the inflammation, what will happen? Inflammation will cause increased blood flow. So the blood flow to the myometrium and endometrium will increase. So when the blood flow increased to the myometrium and endometrium, when the endometrium shed off, what will happen? Bleeding will be high. And when there is a inflammation into the myometrium and fibrotic changes in the myometrium, myometrium will fail to contract. When the myometrium is failed to contract, what will happen? Bleeding will be high. So it can cause regular heavy menstrual bleeding and dysmenorrhea. So in between the period, there is no reason for the bleeding. But if it is a polyp, yes, it can cause bleeding. If it is a malignancy, it can cause bleeding. Do you understand? So causes intermental spotting, false. It won't cause. It's a pre-malignant lesion. Adenomyosis is a pre-malignant lesion. It's false, right? So this is an inflammatory process. It's not a pre-malignant, it's false. Predispose to adenocarcinoma of the endometrium. No, it won't cause any adenomatic carcinomatous changes. It's false. So answer for question number two, true, true, false, false, false. Question number three, management of dysfunctional uterine bearing. What is dysfunctional uterine bearing? It is due to dysfunction of the endometrium. So it is common in perimenopausal age. So actually there is no problem you identified. The ovary, your hormonal function, your structural function, your endometrium, everything is normal. But still, they are having bleeding. That is called dysfunctional uterine bleeding. So how to manage? Your management could be either you can symptomatically manage the bleeding or you can give the hormonal treatment to stabilize the endometrium or you can remove the endometrium or you can take the uterus out. Those are the management options. So symptomatic management, hormonal treatment to stabilize the endometrium or you can remove the endometrium or you can remove the uterus. Those are the management. So non-hormonal treatment, you can give tranexamic acid. Hormonal treatment, you can give OCP or you can give progestin. So progestin can be given oral progestin or you can give local progestin. What is local progestin? You can insert the levonages mm -hmm. intrauterine system, marina. So that will release the local progestin into the endometrium. So endometrium will atrophy and they, they won't be bleeding. So you can give the local progestin or you can take the endometrium out. Minimally invasive surgeries like 
trans cervical resection of endometrium, endometrial ablation. Oh, you can take the uterus or TH. Those are the management options. Here they are asking management of dysfunctional uterine bleeding. Tranexamic acid is useful. True or false? Yeah, that's true. Endometrial ablation is a recognized method. True or false? True. IUCD is an acceptable method. False. IUCD is not having hormone. That is for the contraception. So yeah, you are you have to give the hormone to stabilize the endometrium. Actually, IUCD will worsen the condition because if you put the IUCD, that will stimulate the endometrium, irritate the endometrium, and it, it can cause heavy bleeding. So IUCD is not a management option. LNG IUS is a management option, not the IUCD. GNRH analog cause menopausal symptoms. Yeah, that's true. You can give GNRH analog. Once you give the GNRH analog, there is no GNRH, no FSH. No ovary, ovary and stimulation, no estrogen, no cyclical change, no bleeding. It is causing pseudomenopause. So GNR can cause pseudomenopause. So pseudomenopause might cause menopausal symptom. That's true. LMG IUS is contraindicated. That's false, oh. right? Yeah. LNG IUS is the first line treatment according to the NICE. So it's false. So answer for question number three, true, true, false, true, false. Question number four, complication of ovulation induction. So if, if a patient presented to you for subfertility treatment, you need to uh, uh, induce the ovary to produce the ova. That is called ovulation induction. You are inducing the ovary to produce the ova. That is called ovulation induction. But when you induce the lay ovulation, what will happen? More than one follicle might stimulate. When more than one follicle stimulate, what will happen? Two babies can produce. So risk of multiple pregnancy is high. Second, when multiple follicles are releasing, these chemical mediators will be high. High amount of chemical mediators will release. So it can cause leakage of fluid into the space. What is that condition we call? That is called ovarian hypersensitivity. OHSS. Ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Right. So here they are asking complication of ovulation induction, OHSS. Yeah, of course, that is true. Endometrial CA. No, there is no risk due to ovulation induction. It's false. Multiple pregnancy. Yeah, that's true. PID, pelvic inflammatory disease. Ovulation induction is not a risk factor for PID, but after the ovulation induction for the IVF, sometimes we are retrieving the egg. To retrieve the egg, we are pricking the, uh, pricking the ovary through the needle, through the vagina. That time it's a risk factor for the PID. But ovulation induction itself, it's not a, indicator, not a risk factor for PID. It's false. Early menopause, if you induce, you will deplete the ovum very fast and you can cause early menopause. True or false? It's false, right? Because you need to know that by inducing, you can't advance the menopause. Menopausal age is actually genetically dependent. They are a multifactorial, but genetic also has an important. So early menopause is not a complication of um, ovulation induction. It's false. So true, false, true, false, false. Next question, in subfertility, tubal obstruction commonly caused by PID. True or false? It's false. Tubal obstruction can cause uh, subfertility, but tubal obstruction is not commonly caused by PID. PID is one of the cause, but it's not the common cause. Common cause is endometriosis, right? Not the PID, it's false. High Anti-mullerian hormone level indicate ovulation. True or false? What is anti-mullerian hormone? Anyone? Anti-mullerian hormone is a marker of ovarian reserve. You all can identify whether 
your ovary and follicle count is okay or already depleted by assessing the handy mullerian -Hand hormone. So AMH is used to identify the ovary and reserve, not the ovulation. So what is the hormone we are assessing to assess whether she ovulated or not? How do we assess whether she ovulated or not? Progesterone. Very good, progesterone. Very good, progesterone. So midluteal progesterone. So if the midluteal progesterone more than 30 nanomol per deciliter, it's indicate ovulation. So progesterone is the one is to use to identify the ovulation, not the AMH. AMH is a marker of ovarian reserve. It's false. Sheehan syndrome is managed by FSH therapy. What is Sheehan syndrome? Pituitary necrosis. Very good. Pituitary necrosis. So Sheehan syndrome is pituitary necrosis. It is a pituitary necrosis. What is your problem? There won't be any FSH secretion. So FSH is absent. If you want to treat the Sheehan, what you want to do? You want to replace the FSH because your pituitary is not supposed to be FSH. So you have to give the FSH from outside. So what is the treatment for the Sheehan? Is FSH. That's true. Commonest cause for the ovulatory subfertility is due to turners. An ovulatory subfertility is due to turners. True or false? What is the commonest cause for an ovulatory subfertility? Very good. PCOS. PCOS is account for 90% of anovulatory subfertility. 90% of anovulatory subfertility is due to PCOS, not the uh, turner. So it's false. Weight reduction is the main mode of treatment for PCOS. Yeah, that's true. 70% of the mothers will respond to weight reduction. The main mode of treatment for PCOS is weight reduction. True. So answer for question number five. False, false, true, false, true. Regarding PCOS management, combine oral contraceptive pills. True. You, true. Now, somebody asked this question, right? So if it is a lean body PCOS, what is the management? We can give COCP. That's true. TH plus BSO. If it is a PCOS, management is TH plus BSO. False. Yes. False, right? So you don't need to do the remove the uterus and ovary. Yeah, that's false. Hormone replacement therapy. True. Why? COCP purchase. Uh, sorry, no, sir. No, COCP is not a hormone replacement therapy, right? So we, when we are giving the hormone replacement therapy, hormone replacement. When there is a hormone deficiency, only we need to replace it. In because there is no hormone deficiency. There is estrogen, no estrogen. When there is a estrogen deficiency, only we need to give hormone replacement. In PCOS, they have excessive estrogen. So hormone replacement therapy false. Metformin? True. True. Why? No. This is how... Reduce, reduce the metabolism. This is how most of the girls are thinking when they, get, when they take the metformin, they can reduce the weight. Metformin yeah, is insulin resistance. Really metformin it's not for the weight reduction. Actually, metformin will sensitize the insulin. So in PCOS, one of the main reasons for the PCOS is insulin resistance. So you need to reduce the insulin resistance. That's why we give metformin, not for the weight reduction. Metformin is a treatment for PCOS, not for the weight reduction. It's to increase the sensitivity of the insulin, reduce the insulin resistance. Right? That's true. Weight reduction? True. It's a first line. Yeah. yeah. First line treatment. Very good. Sir, so in HRT, does include both estrogen and progesterone? Uh, it's depend. If somebody have uterus, you have to combine estrogen and progesterone. But if somebody does not have uterus, you can give estrogen alone. So hormone replacement therapy can be estrogen alone or combine hormone replacement therapy as well. Okay. So question, question number six answers true, false, false, true, true. Question number seven regarding uterine fibroid. It can be familial. True. 
Yeah. The uterine fibroid has familial tendency. That's true. It is treated with uliprostate acetate. What is uliprostate acetate? Progesterone receptor modulator. Very good. Progesterone receptor modulator. So this progesterone receptor modulator has effect on the fibroid. When you give uliprostate acetate, it will reduce the bleeding as well as it will reduce the size of the fibroid. Right. So when we study the fibroid management, we have studied three type one symptomatic treatment, non hormonal symptomatic treatment, just give the tranexamic acid that will reduce the bleeding. There is no effect on the fibroid size. Second category of treatment is hormonal treatment, which has effect on the bleeding, not the fibroid size like East OCP, progesterone, right? LNG IUS. Those are Reducing the bleeding, but fibroid size will not alter. Some management has reduced the bleeding, can reduce the bleeding as well as reduce the size of the fibroid, like uniprested acetate, GNR channelog. Those are reducing the bleeding as well as reducing the fibroid size. Then the fourth one is surgical management. Surgical management can be minimally invasive or surgery. Minimally invasive is uterine artery embolization. Then surgical management could be a myomectomy, removal of fibroid or removal of uterus, hysterectomy. This myomectomy can be done, uh, laparoscopic myomectomy, hysteroscopic myomectomy, open myomectomy. That is the summary of fibroid management. So you need to keep that in your mind. So non-hormonal symptomatic management, Hormonal symptomatic management, hormonal symptomatic and fibroid management, then surgical management that is minimally invasive and surgery. Minimally invasive is uh, 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 uterine artery embolization. Surgery could be a myomectomy or hysterectomy. Myomectomy could be a hysteroscopic myomectomy, laparoscopic myomectomy, or open myomectomy. So the, you can decide which one you are going to do, hysteroscopy, which one you are going to do, laparoscopy, which one you are going to open laparotomy. That is, we will study in the theory part, but at least you need to have this summary. So uh, it's treated with uliprostyl acetate. Yeah, that's true. It will reduce the size of the uterus as well as bleeding. Red degeneration is due to acute blood disruption. True or false? That's true. Degenerative changes can occur during the pregnancy as well as postmenopausal period. So in postmenopause, the uterine blood flow will reduce. So then the chronically, the blood flow will reduce and uh, fibroid will undergo degenerative changes. That is called highly degeneration or white degeneration. So during the pregnancy, when the fibroid is exposed to a high level of estrogen due to pregnancy, the fibroid is growing very much, but the relative oxygen uh, blood flow is not enough. So then the acute abruption might occur, then it can cause red degeneration, which will cause severe pain. So red degeneration is due to acute blood disruption. Yeah, that's true. Sarcomatous changes in 10 percentage. True or false? It's false, not malignancy change. Yeah, it's false because this fibroid, so there are very controversial things. So now reason evidence, they said the fibroid will not change to sarcomatous change, but few articles they have mentioned the sarcomatous changes from the fibroid is very, very minimal. Very, very minimal, not the 10 percent, less than 1 percent. So it's false. Typical holes appearance uh, uh, is seen in cut section. Yeah, that is the, uh, the, the typical appearance of uh, uh, fibroid. So that's true. So answer for question number seven, true, 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 false, true. Question number eight, HSG delineates the uterine cavity. True or false? HSG. Yeah, of course, it's true because when you inject the radiopaque material into the uterine cavity, right, initially that will fill the uterine cavity. You are taking the x-ray, then you can see the complete structure of the uterine cavity. When there is a fibroid or when there is an abnormal uterine cavity, so then this uh, radiopaque material will fill with the different shape. So then you can simply identify this cavity is not regular. So you can identify the uterine cavity abnormalities by the HSG. That's true. Uh, uterine HSG is a test of tubal function. True or false? 
it's false right because you don't have any test to identify the function of the tube you can identify the patency of the tube whether tubes are patent or not it's false performed by injection of methylene blue through the cervix we are the catheter fine catheter true or false right it's false false methylene blue it's used use to i but for the hft you are taking the extra no so then it should be radio opaque material not the methylene blue it's false performing secretory phase we are doing in secretory phase true or false it's false because if you see your menstrual cycle it could be a proliferative and secretory proliferative phase obviously we know the follicles are developing but in secretory phase already the ovum has been released we don't know whether fertilization occur or not because once the ovum release there might be a pregnancy but to identify the pregnancy you need to wait until 4 to 5 weeks after 2 3 weeks of implantation fertilization only you can identify by your urine test or blood test but still she could be pregnant so once the ovum release she could be in early pregnancy so when she is in early pregnancy can you do the x ray for this patient can you inject the radio opaque material no you can't that's why you have to do this test before the ovum release so it should be in the proliferative phase right before 14 days of the cycle not after 14 days not in the secretory phase do you understand so perform in secretory phase it's false may show obstruction in the absence of tube obstruction true obstruction true or false false it's, it's dependent no 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 it's true because this hst we are doing without any anesthesia so when you are injecting the dye this dye will uh, go through the tube then tube will get uh, distended that time patient might have severe pain so due to this pain the smooth muscle will get contracted spasm and due to the smooth muscle spasm you can have pseudo obstruction so hsc you can have obstruction due to muscle spasm so that's why they are they are telling if the tubes are patent in hsc 100 percentage you can say the tube is patent but tubes are obstruction obstructed in hsc 100 percentage you can't say it's obstruction it could be due to false obstruction you need to do lap and die under anesthesia right so perform so may show obstruction in the absence of tube obstruction yeah that's true because of the pain so answer for question number 8 true false 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 true question number 9 the following are the risk factor for premature ovary and failure ovulation induction already we have discussed ovulation induction will not cause premature ovary and failure it's false early menarche no early menarche it's not a risk factor for the early menopause right it's false ovary and tb that's true because when you have an infection in the ovary that inflammation might damage the follicles and huge number of follicle might get damaged and she, her follicles might deplete bit early it can cause oophoritis is a is a is a complication or, or is a uh, cause for the premature ovary ovary uh, uh, failure that's true usage of cocb if you use cocb it can cause premature ovary failure it's false usage of cocb will not change your menopausal age it won't it won't postpone or it won't prepone it's false neonatal phototherapy false right neonatal phototherapy will not have any effect in your ovary and follicles there is no that, that is a the, the uv light no that will not have any effect in your follicles it's false so answer for question number 9 false false true false false question number 10 which of the following statements are true regarding normal pregnancy blood pressure fall in second trimester what do you think true or false yeah that's true in second trimester what will happen blood pressure will start to fall and after the 28 weeks then again it start to raise near to delivery it will come to the pre pregnancy level usually pre blood pressure fall and go to the pre pregnancy level so this is how the 
blood pressure change. Why the blood pressure is reducing during pregnancy? Because of the blood vessel dilatation due to the effect of progesterone. So this progesterone, which is secreted by the placenta, will relax the smooth muscles of uh, blood vessels. So blood vessels will get dilated and pleasant, the, 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 the dilatation will increase and resistance will reduce, blood pressure will come down. So blood pressure falls in second trimester, that's true. Plasma volume decreased throughout the gastration. What do you think? It's false. Plasma volume will increase throughout the pregnancy. After 30 weeks, 32 weeks, it is plateau. Why plasma volume is increasing during pregnancy? Because of the estrogen. The placenta will produce estrogen as well as progestin. This estrogen will have effect of fluid retention. Estrogen will cause fluid retention. That's why when you take the OCP, you are gaining the weight because estrogen will have effect by fluid retention. So you will become a kind of obese, right? So during pregnancy, people are becoming obese. Why? Because of the estrogen. Plasma volume will increase. There is a reduction in erythrocyte production. It's false. false. It's liver production is because liver proteins are increased. Very good. Erythrocyte production, RBC production will be high, but patient will be anemic. Why? Because of uh, uh, plasma volume, identity Actually, plasma volume also increase, RBC also increase, but plasma volume is increase will be high. That's why they are getting hemodilution. So RBC production, erythrocyte production will increase. There is no question. But plasma volume increase, that's why they are physiologically anemic because of the hemodilution. Very good. Right. There is a reduction in erythrocyte. 50% oh, okay. of the women have transient diastolic murmur. Keep it in your mind. All the diastolic murmurs are pathologic. All the diastolic murmurs are pathologic. But these pregnant mothers might have ejection systolic murmur, especially over the pulmonary area because of the hyperdynamic circulation. Right? Ejection systolic murmur over the pulmonary area due to hyperdynamic circulation. That could be normal. But all the diastolic murmurs are pathologic. Keep it in your mind. All the diastolic murmurs are pathologic. All the diastolic murmurs are pathologic. Got it? All the diastolic murmurs are pathologic. Right. There is an increase in the number of polymorpho leukocytes. That's true. You can easily remember this one. Right. So what will happen to the immune status during pregnancy? Reduce. Yes. Reduce because pregnancy is an immunosuppressive stage. So when the immune system is reducing, so there should be protection to the body, right? So when there is a, a foreign body or maybe a microorganism coming to the body, that, that organism needs to be engulfed by the body. So then what will happen? The WBC, especially the neutrophil, will increase to compensate. So WBC count will increase during pregnancy. You can simply remember that one, right? So there is an increase in number of polymorphonucleoside. Yeah, that's true because it is a protection for your body, right? So what is uh, what is the percentage of systolic murmur in pregnancy? Actually, there is no pregnant percentage, but you can have. Uh, commonly, you will have the uh, systolic murmur. So in 20-year-old girl presenting with the dysmenorrhea and abdominal pain, on ultrasound scan shows 6 to 5 centimeter multilocular cyst covered it with thick septae. CA125 level is 80. What is the best management option? So this is a uh, endometrioma. Endometrioma more than uh, 3 centimeter, you have to remove the uh, uh, cyst wall because there is a small increased risk of uh, endometroid carcinoma in the uh, ovary. So cystectomy will be the management. So is this an endometrioma? Yes. Okay, what are the clues to say the endometrioma? Okay, the clues are, uh, she's having dysmenorrhea, that is one. Second, multilocular cyst, that is second. Third one is uh, 
six septa is third one. Fourth one is CA125 is bit high, 80. Those are the features suggestive of endometrioma. Right, so if it is a malignancy, of course, uh, this pain and these clinical features are not so suggestive of malignancy. Anyhow, you are doing the cystectomy. If it is a malignancy, then you can diagnose a malignancy as well. So that's why we are doing the cystectomy and we don't do the oophorectomy because she's young and we know it's endometrioma. You can't remove the ovary. That is not, uh, not uh, nice. Okay, right. So I need to go to the vote. So I think you might utilize this class. So uh, hopefully I'll do uh, continue this free session until they announce your exam. After that, we will do the exam paper series. Okay. Uh, okay. So thanks for joining to the class. Uh, if you have any doubt, you can contact me. Uh, thanks a lot. Okay, bye.